Oh, beloved sibling, welcome, welcome. It is I, Aaron Freeman, not a scientist, but a sciencey optimist. Today I am talking with Dr. Jules Lobel here at the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting in San Diego. Dr. Lobel, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So you, uh, first of all, you're not a neuroscientist. I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a law professor and a lawyer. At the University of Pittsburgh. University of Pittsburgh, and I was president of the Center for Constitutional Rights, but I use neuroscience in my cases. This is what <laughs> why I really wanted to talk to you, because you actually use, well, first of all, science, science and neuroscience is often mind-blowing, but in this particular case, on this particular day, it was immensely eye-opening. Well, tell us a little about how you use neuroscience in to help people suffering, people who are who have been in solitary confinement. Yeah, I represent a, a class of thousands of prisoners in California who were in solitary confinement, often for decades, sometimes for two decades, in small windowless cells, 23 hours a day, day after day, no rec no uh, uh, group recreation. No phone calls, no contact visits, uh, no educational programming, no vocational programming, uh, basically totally isolated. And the question that we had to confront is why is this cruel and unusual punishment? And it seemed obvious. It seems obvious to me that if you put somebody in a small cell and weave them there... Now, when we say day, small, we're talking like the size of a king-size bed. Uh, no, the size of a, a, about half the size of a typical walk-in closet. Oh, you know, so, you know, basically you just, you just have room to move around, but you don't have much other room. And you're there for years, 23 hours a day. I say to myself, anybody has to see this as cruel and inhumane treatment. But unfortunately, the courts did not. Even a very progressive uh, judge, Felton Henderson, who was a civil rights activist and hero, uh, said, you know, this is very draconian. The, the uh, inmates uh, are walking, pacing around in their cell as if they were animals in the zoo. But the only damage that they could show is psychological damage. And, you know, depression, paranoia, uh, memory loss, all of that, it's bad, but people in society face this. Other prisoners face this. And so it's not so terrible that uh, it rises to the level of constitutional violation. And I think the reason he took that position is because it, there's a deeply ingrained division in American law between the mind and the body, between mental harm and physical harm, uh, between emotional harm and you know bodily injury. And you can and if somebody gets hit by a guard, uh, that's clearly cruel and unusual punishment. But if somebody gets put in a cell for years and years and it causes their mind to be damaged, uh, uh, that's seen as sort of things that people ordinarily suffer. So we had to think outside the box and we had to figure out a way to get before a judge uh, the idea that this doesn't just create mental injury, but the mental injury has a physical component and the brain it not only controls your mind, but it's a physical organ. And neuroscience deals with the damage to the brain that isolation could cause. Well, now, you, you were a part of a panel, of two panels, both of which I saw today, mm -hmm. that did, and we won't go into it too deeply, but there are some very serious, measurable neurological changes that take place, that neurons shrink in, in rats, uh, mm -hmm. a rat who's raised in a family group, in a, a multi-generational family group, then put into isolation after a month. The neurons shrink 20%, the dendritic spines increase in length by 20% by trying to find <laughs> those shrunken neurons, mm -hmm. and we can go down a very long list, which I won't. But you did have some success. For example, I understand with, with the shoe. What is the shoe? The shoe is a euphemism. It's the security housing unit. Uh, because California doesn't say that they have solitary confinement. They just have secure housing. But secure housing means you keep the person in their cell uh, in isolation 23, 24 hours a day. Now, this is at what prison? At Pelican Bay State Prison, which is uh, put in the far northern reaches of California, right on the bar border with Oregon. Uh, very, very difficult to get to. Uh, it's one of the most isolated places in the United States. 
And so uh, most of the prisoners who were from Los Angeles, their families could never visit them, their friends couldn't visit them, even if they were allowed visits. And they were never allowed any contact visits. So if you visited the person, you had to see him behind the window and talk to them on an intercom. But that was the, uh, the site of one of your successes. That was, a, and we brought this suit, and we, uh, we, did, we did get a neuroscientist to offer expert uh, testimony, and he said that uh, the kind of pain that people experience when they're in isolation is the same pain uh, neuro neurologically in the brain as physical pain. It's the same neurons that are activated. Right. And that's the first thing he said. The second thing was that social connectivity, social interaction, is a basic human need. And it's like exercise, it's like water, food, sleep. Uh, it's not that you'll die immediately if you, get no so if you don't get social interaction, but your brain will be significantly damaged. Uh, so we, we use that kind of evidence. Well, this, the panel that you were on, which also included uh, James King... Robert, Robert King, King, I'm sorry, Robert spent King. 29 years in solitary in Louisiana. 29, which I, we want to get to him in a second, mm -hmm. because in, well, for the reason that he was in there is also one of the reasons that he was able to, to survive and cope. But the panel that you were on was initially rejected for inclusion into this conference. Well, not into this conference, but the, con this, the conference before this. Oh, okay. We, we tried to get it in the one a year last, ago. last year in last Washington. Year. Okay. And, and it was rejected, right. but now... Well, we tried again. We, we, uh, <laughs> we're persistent. We're oh, persistent. What is your phrase? Uh, 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 something without success? Uh, success without victory. Success without victory. <laughs> yes. Sometimes you can't win a victory in court, but you can still get success out of it because you educate the public. You, even if you lose in court, you can still have success in the political arena or in the educational front. So some of the cases that I've taken, like this one, um, we're seen as hopeless to begin with, and oftentimes you lose hopeless cases, but uh, in many of the cases we, we um, energized and activated public opinion, which had an ultimate success. Now, what were the specifics of the Pelican Bay case? The specifics were that there were 1,300 prisoners in Pelican Bay who were kept in these small cells without windows, uh, and they were kept there for years. Are there 1,300 Shoe cells? There, were, there was a prison with 1,300 isolation cells that was built in the state of California just for this purpose. And the people who you would think that the prisoners that they would put there would be psychopaths, mass murderers, people who, if you let them in the general population in prison, are going to kill somebody. But, That's certainly what I would think. But uh, that was not the population they put in this prison. The population they put in this prison were people who were either gang members or what they called gang associates. And a gang associate is, if the two of us were having a discussion here in prison, and you turned out that you were a gang member, and I was not a gang member, uh, but I'm associating with you. And I'm associating with you, and therefore I'm tarred by my association, and they could send me right to Pelican Bay. And the only way out um, was to become an informant, because uh, uh, my experience at Pelican Bay, with the prisons of Pelican Bay, I first learned when I watched, watched West Side Story as a kid. And you know, there's the song, When You're a Jet, You're a Jet oh, yes. Away from Your First Day. Cigarette to Your Last, last Dying day. day. Yes. And that's what California felt about these gang associates. So if you were associated with a gang, you were going to be in the gang for life. The only way to w release you from this, for, and, and therefore they had to keep you in this solitary for the rest of your life, the only way to release you is if you dropped out of the gang. The only way to drop out of the gang is to become an informant. And if you become an informant, then, of course, the gang wants to kill you. Uh, and, and then you could be released, but you couldn't be released into the general population because now the gang wants to kill you. So you're still put into a special prison population. Now, I asked uh, Robert King, who did, as you mentioned, spent 29 years, right. uh, how he coped. And he said that... Uh, Politi politi political politics, right? That politics uh, and seeing and, and organizing, or did, did they organize in the shoe? Yeah, they. Uh, it, well, he was in Louisiana. Not he was. Oh, he in, was not in the shoe. They okay. call every state has a different name for this. Okay, but they're all the same thing: solitary confinement. 
and he organized the, as part of the Black Panthers, uh, and they organized both to to educate people, uh, and they organized to resist. So he had to have a mental capacity of resistance, and he realized he was being put in here in in solitary for oppressive reasons, and he wasn't going to let the, them get the better of him. So oh, he was, oppressive reasons. Well, because not not because he had done anything bad. In fact, he was innocent of the charges that led him to prison in the first place. But he was put in prison and then put in solitary because he was a political activist, because he was a member of the Black Panther Party. And they thought he was dangerous. Because many people in this country wind up in solitary, not because they've done anything uh, bad. Of course, they've done something bad to get him into prison many times. But because the prison officials consider themselves them dangerous. And you could be dangerous because you speak back to prison officials. You could be dangerous because you organize. You could be dangerous because you're a gang affiliate. There's many reasons, but they don't have to prove anything. They don't have to. They can just stick you in the shoe. Well, you know, I'm from the west side of Chicago. And mm -hmm. in, in, in Chicago, we say that there are a lot of ways to end up in prison. Being guilty is just one of them. Correct. Correct. <laughs> but, um, but in the case of the uh, people in Pelican Bay, they eventually overcame their different differences. And this is a remarkable story, which I didn't talk about in the panel. But there were Northern Hispanics, Southern, His I mean, Northern Hispanics from the Bay Area, Southern Hispanics from LA and San Diego, blacks and whites who were associated with the Aryan Brotherhood, or the prison uh, officials said they were associated with the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, and they all united to go on a hunger strike, which got national attention, protesting their conditions of confinement. And I think that resistance, like Robert King's, allowed many of them to uh, overcome this solitary confinement without going crazy. But that political resistance, that politicization, mm -hmm. is also one of the reasons Robert King was in there for as long as he was. Correct. Correct. So that it, that's what helped him survive, and it's what it's <laughs> made it necessary for him to survive. Right, and that's true for some of uh, uh, many of my clients were with groups like, uh, particularly the uh, African Americans, were there because of their political orientation, and not because of any gang activities or anything like that. Who pays you? Uh, are there GoFundMe? <laughs> I mean, I assume no, the guys I, in prison. I, I, I work for the. Uh, I don't work. I, I'm as affiliated. I'm an associate with the Center for Constitutional Rights, and we're a major human rights group in New York City, but we have a national and international presence, and we do fundraising. They don't pay me. Um, I do these cases pro bono for free. Um, uh, I'm a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. They pay me a salary, so right. I'm not on the street, I'm not homeless. <laughs> uh, and, if, and sometimes when we win, I, we do get attorney's fees. So the state will have to compensate us for the time. But often, either if you don't win or you win a case that there's no fees, you're doing it because you believe it's just. That's why I do this. You also pointed, I mentioned that, that you're, you believe that you benefited from your collaboration with neuroscientists, with, from your stepping outside your legal comfort zone. Can Correct. you tell us yeah. a little about that? Well, you know, you often academics get into a certain rote routine. You know, you write on uh, solitary confinement and you can talk about the court cases. You're, you're familiar with the court cases. In this context, I thought it was very important to, to integrate law and neuroscience and to try to show the benefits both fields could have from that integration. And that led me to learn and have to deal with whole new areas of the mind and of expertise that I was familiar with. And it was a great experience because my co-author, Huda Akil, is a wonderful uh, academic, a wonderful neuroscientist. And I learned a huge amount, which I wouldn't have learned if I just wrote the article on my own. There was a gentleman who, uh, who had spent, I think, even a good amount of time. He was at the second Jack, set. Jack Morris. Jack Morris, who's also an artist, yeah. uh, and who's written. But he, he he described something that I found very moving. He said that he was here watching these 
and listening to these academics discussing in their academic neuroscientific terms the stuff that he'd spent decades right. feeling and going through. And I assume that there was a similar thing for you, that to hear the kind of academic neuroscientific version of what you knew about, of, of the conditions and behaviors and suffering that you knew about already in the yeah. prison population. For example, even in today's panel, I learned something new that I didn't know about, um, which is uh, the woman social scientist from Chicago, um, she talked about one of the problems of loneliness is sleep deprivation. And all of my clients, almost, I mean, virtually all of them in the shoe, complain about sleep deprivation. <laughs> and you would think it would be to the contrary. If you have nothing, nothing to do, to do right. but sleep, you would sleep all the time. Uh, but in fact, they can't sleep. Well, the, the, I guess the, the, the without because the, there's no windows. There's no windows, and they it haven't. disrupts your circadian, your circadian rhythms. Because we are evolved to wake up with the sun or go That's to right. sleep with the sun, and it, it, it's a wholly unnatural condition. I assume uh, that the reason, one of the reasons, well, no, no, you forget what I mm -hmm. assume. Why was it rejected from, from this panel? Rejected from the Washington conference? Any idea? Yeah. Do you know? To tell you the truth, I don't know. Okay. Um, you assume and I assume that maybe neuroscience, uh, neuroscience society wasn't quite ready for this at the time. You know? Well, I can tell you absolutely that I saw the press conference this morning mm -hmm. and was all lit up and mm -hmm. ran around to some of my neuroscience buddies here and their position was, at least two of them, their position was, they're criminals. They yeah. get what they deserve. Right. Who cares about cons? And I can only assume that that's why I didn't really think about the rigors and the torture of that is well, that's solitary. The, the problem in our society is we have two million people more than any other country in prison, and they're marginalized. Nobody thinks about them. The society says they're criminals, uh, they're bad people, lock them up and put them away. Now, other societies, like I visited maximum security prisons in Norway, and they have a totally different perspective on prisoners. Their view in Norway is that prisoners are people just like us. They're part of the community. They're not bad people. They've done something bad, and therefore they have to be put in prison and, and help to rehabilitate, help to come back to the community. Here, the way we run our prisons, uh, it's, it's uh, dangerous and it's, and it's criminal. And, and, in my view, in that we're putting people who have problems to begin with, often mental health problems, mental mental ill, uh, often problems dealing with society, and instead of giving them the help they need, we make them angrier, make them more violent, and put them in conditions that are very violent. And uh, if we and most of these people are going to go back onto the streets. Right. And so if we really were serious about protecting society, we would care about the way we treat our prisoners. And that's, I think, a key reason why we did this panel. Well, at the end of your morning press conference, I came up to you and I said that, that your message is essentially hopeful and optimistic. Because my sense is that what you want to do is use these data, that you, this neuroscience that you found, to empower those folks within the justice system who do recognize the inhumanity and the cruelty of this. You mentioned that there were judges who, who, who are looking for an excuse to yeah. treat. Looking for a good reason yeah. to rule uh, against this solitary confinement. I am a fundamental optimist because I believe that you can only change society if you believe that change is possible. If you believe that you and others can, uh, ev can accomplish change. Even in a time of real woe, like we're in now in the United States, uh, I think change is possible. You know, I once represented uh, a very, uh, one of my hero heroes who recently died, Congressman Ron Dellums from oh, yes. uh, Oakland. I, I represented him in a major case challenging uh, uh, the United States President Bush going to war without congressional approval. And we got in front of a hundred press people and they were all asking him one version or another, the same question. What gives, what makes you think you have a snowball's chance in hell of winning this case? And his answer was, all your questions are incredibly cynical and cynics have never changed the world.
<laughs> and I always remember that. Well, uh, <laughs> Professor Jules Lobel, I am just immensely inspired, delighted, and honored to talk with you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been great to be with you. Just a delight, my brother. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Look forward to seeing you next time on the Chicago Brain Buddies.